afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Charlie Ebinger, a senior fellow in the Energy and Climate Change Initiative here at Brookings, and we are indeed delighted today to welcome back Admiral Pat, who I think was here just about a year ago, uh, particularly to talk today about, uh, with kind of U.S. chairmanship, kind of midpoint, I think, uh, where he sees uh, our remaining agenda items uh, need to be. Um, and as we turn it over to uh, the Finns, and also uh, hopefully give us some insights on what has yet to be accomplished that he had hoped might be under his tenure. I'm not going to go into a lengthy bio of the Admiral because I think he knows more people in the room than I do, but I think we all know that he became the State Department's Special Representative for the Arctic in July 2014 and where he leads the effort to advance U.S. interests throughout the Arctic region with a very broad focus on Arctic governance, climate change, economic and environmental issues, and of course, finally, security concerns. So without further ado, I will welcome the Admiral. I think he has uh, a few slides, and then after he's done with his formal presentation, the two of us will be up here and we'll start a conversation, but we want to open it up as rapidly as possible for the floor. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. Good afternoon, everybody. Have you just had lunch or something? <laughs> yeah, probably. Well, it's good to see you all, and, and uh, it's also good to see so many familiar faces out here. Uh, it seems like the same crowd, for the most part, shows up almost every time I speak or at the Arctic conferences that I'm at. I can't tell whether that's because people are honestly interested or they're just trying to keep me honest, one or the other. But in any case, it's good to see all the seats filled here, and, and thank you so much for coming to listen to a little bit about what we're doing with the Arctic Council. Uh, I want to thank Charlie Ebinger for having me here. Uh, it was, I think, a little bit over a year ago when I came to Brookings for the first time to speak about our stand-up for the Arctic Council. Uh, we were looking for opportunities at that time, venues that we could talk about our upcoming program. Uh, Brookings was very generous at that time. Uh, I also want to thank, uh, I don't know where she went to, Captain Frances Masali. Frances, or, there she is in the back, uh, one of the fellows here at Brookings, of whom I'm very proud. Uh, if I can put my Coast Guard hat figuratively back on uh, for just a moment, uh, what I would say is uh, I think all Coast Guard officers are pretty darn good, uh, but we send, uh, we send many of the best uh, for fellowships and in institutions like this. It, it not only, I think, benefits the institutions themselves having that Coast Guard uh, perspective, uh, because as, as I've said many times, uh, Coast Guard officers over the course of their career uh, develop a broad understanding of security. You know, many people on, in uniform, and in fact many people in this town, even at institutions that I speak to, when you talk national security, what they're really thinking is national defense. And, uh, and as we approach the Arctic, the national defense part, the hard part of security, uh, is not something that we take under consideration in the Arctic Council, at least not uh, in the course of our business. But the much broader concept of security, those sort of multi-mission things that Coast Guard officers deal with, uh, are uh, the types of things we deal with in the Arctic Council. Energy security, environmental security. Uh, maritime security, security of food, etc. It's a, it's a much more challenging, broader portfolio to deal with. And I think that, uh, if I can say so proudly, uh, I think Coast Guard officers can add to that conversation in these uh, institutions across the town. And Frances herself, uh, if I can just speak on her for a moment, uh, just a tremendously wonderful shipmate that I was uh, privileged to serve with during my time. Uh, she had a really strong operational background as a Coast Guard naval aviator, uh, and then uh, I met her first uh, down at uh, Air Station uh, Elizabeth City, uh, our biggest air station, where she had amazing responsibilities. But then she came up and commanded Air Station Washington, where she did simple things like flying the Commandant and the, uh, and the Secretary of Homeland Security to various places around the world. Something which, by the way, I miss greatly. I, I miss the people, too, but down that Gulf Stream, I really miss that uh, in my travels nowadays. But, you know, economy in Alaska Airlines is, is adequate and, uh, and certainly uh, good stewardship for the taxpayers. But anyway, Francis, good to see you and uh, my other Coast Guard uh, shipmates that I see in the room as well. So we had uh, scheduled this initially a couple weeks ago. 
Uh, but during that same week, we had presentations at CSIS, the Wilson Center, and, and Heritage, uh, all in consecutive days. And when we looked at the schedule, I said, you know, I don't want to diminish uh, or overshadow Brookings in any way, because it's very important. They gave me a chance uh, at the start of this process to speak, and I want to separate that from the rest. And it worked out well for the schedule. It also works out well because we are uh, almost exactly, as it's been pointed out to, to me several times today, uh, we're one day past the date that we accepted the gavel for the Arctic Council chairmanship. So we are at the halfway point. I think a good time to reflect a little bit on what has transpired over the last year or more, and some of those things that we have to consider for the future as we go forward in our chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and I think some of the things that we as a country need to consider as we approach the, uh, the end of our chairmanship, but certainly not the end of our involvement in the Arctic. So uh, right out of the gate last year, 100 days after we accepted uh, the, uh, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, people were already evaluating how we were doing in the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And uh, there was an article that was written that actually gave us pretty good grades on our program and on the, the performance of the team within the State Department. However, when they got, the author got to talking about me, she was complimentary, but then as I got <laughs> into the article a little further, she said, but of course, Admiral Papp, while a great strength to the program, is, always, is also one of its greatest weaknesses. And I was kind of hurt. But as I read on, she said, he's not an Arctic expert. And when I read that, I said, well, certainly, guilty as charged. I'm not an Arctic expert. And I've never claimed to be anything other than a sailor. But I've also claimed over the years that being a sailor, and oh, by the way, she said I like to tell sea stories and talk about history. So I don't want to disappoint anybody today, so I will talk a little sea stories and a little bit of history, but, uh, but the bulk will be uh, on the program. So one of the things I learned as a sailor is forehandedness and understanding the environment that you're going to work in. And this started out in my first assignment as an ensign in the Coast Guard reporting to a ship in Adak, Alaska. And the captain of the ship gave me two things to read before I could even start the process of qualifying as a deck watch officer. The first was a book called The Thousand Mile War. Uh, it's the story of U.S. Uh, in, the, in the Aleutian Islands and the Bering Sea uh, uh, over the course of World War II. And the reason they gave it to us is because, first of all, he said history is important. We learn from history. And the book very graphically talked about the challenges of weather and time and distance uh, that uh, U.S. service people, particularly the Navy, faced in World War II in operating in those conditions up there. So before we even took in the lines and the ship got underway, he wanted me to understand the operating environment. The other thing that he gave me to read was a letter written by Admiral Chester Nimitz uh, that talks about forehandedness and preparation as well. I, I may get to that later in my comments, but, uh, but once again, another historical thing to put into context the area where we are about to operate and to help me understand some of the challenges we're going to face. And I think those lessons, uh, whether you're being a captain of a ship, uh, commanding officer of a unit, uh, uh, a representative of the United States and the State Department, it's good to understand the history, how you got to a certain point, and the conditions that you're going to operate in. So where are we operating in now? Well, we are halfway through, as I said, our chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And as most of you know, the Arctic Council is a high-level forum in which the eight Arctic states and the region's indigenous groups gather to discuss and, more importantly, act upon circumpolar issues. A year ago yesterday, we received the Arctic Council gavel from Canada, assuming leadership of the body until May of 2017. Now, when I first took the role as U.S. Special Representative of the Arctic, I uh, gave a stump speech at the time talking about the six most commonly heard comments when we presented our Arctic Council chairmanship program to the other countries and to various groups around town. I know a lot of you have heard that discussion before, so I'll just synthesize a little bit. The first thing was uh, they applauded us for a balanced program. Second, they said it was a very ambitious program. At the time, uh, the, uh, the sanctions on Russia had been imposed, and uh, the, so the third most 
frequently received comment or question was, what about Russia? How are you going to deal with Russia? But uh, comments four and five were the ones that interested me the most. Comment number four was, we're really excited about United States leadership. And then the, second, uh, the, the next comment, though, was, we're skeptical about the United States' commitment to the Arctic. So we're wondering whether it will continue beyond the Arctic Council. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, some people are still expressing some skepticism about our long-term commitment, but I sincerely hope that by our actions over the last year, and this was echoed over that uh, week two years ago when we met at multiple venues, uh, the most common comment that was heard, and uh, uh, Ambassador Alice of Norway asked me this question after the three days. He says, what, do you learn, have, what have you learned from these conferences? What I learned was everybody thinks the U.S. gets it now. The problem, the challenge, will be to sustain that momentum, as, particularly as we face a change in leadership in our nation here shortly. But uh, the Arctic is, without a doubt, a high priority for our nation. In particular, President Obama's historic visit to Alaska last summer, where he became the first sitting president to visit the U.S. Arctic, underscores our deep interest in the region. The president spent three full days. I mean, can you imagine how difficult it is to get the president of the United States to devote his personal attention for three days on any one subject? But he did, and uh, while attending the Glacier Conference to speak to the assembled uh, foreign participants, he also visited those communities in which climate change is significantly impacting the Arctic environment and the people who call this region home. As a result of his time in Alaska, the President is now personally engaged in Arctic issues. I can tell you that with personal knowledge that he is personally engaged and this is a high priority. And at the White House and the associated staff like OMB, uh, there is a sense of urgency that progress has to be made now in advancing our Arctic priorities. In fact, the President's visit generated concrete commitments that make our goal of an enduring Arctic an achievable reality. He announced that we'll be seeking funding for new icebreakers, something near and dear to a former Commandant of the Coast Guard's heart, and he announced that uh, we'll seek uh, that, that we'll be able to provide year-round assured access in responding to communities and enhancing our emergency response capabilities in the region. Uh, the White House is also dedicating $4 million to promote energy innovation opportunities for remote Alaskan villages so the Alaska residents will have access to affordable and sustainable energy options that they need. And he further pledged, among other domestic priorities, to bolster our efforts to chart the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas to improve our navigational tools and to ensure safe passage through these volatile and often treacherous waters. Internationally, U.S. leadership over the last year has propelled other key Arctic initiatives. In June, the Arctic Council released groundbreaking procedures for the safe operation of unmanned aircraft systems in the Arctic, the first international guidelines that include protocols for the use of these aircraft across an entire geographic region. In fact, the International Civil Aviation Organization has praised the guidelines and is going to use them as a benchmark for other similar regional protocols. We also celebrated this year the launch of the Arctic Offshore Regulators Forum. Now, this is a Bessie-led group of uh, the interagency and petroleum experts who are dedicated to improving offshore safety regulations in the Arctic. The United States was instrumental in forming the group and serves as its current chair. And the forum, I'm pleased to say, is making quick progress. It approved its terms of rep reference at the inaugural meeting last summer and we'll meet here in Washington later this week to discuss emerging offshore issues. Though independent of the Arctic Council, the Regulators Forum plans to per periodically update the Arctic Council on its work. Also under U.S. leadership, the Arctic states have made significant progress in enacting two legally binding agreements that they previously negotiated on the auspices of the Arctic Council. That's the 2011 Search and Rescue Agreement and the 2011 uh, oil Spill Preparedness and Response Agreement. Uh, as a guy who was an operator and involved in consequence management, uh, when I came to the State Department, I said, well, great, legally binding agreements are very good. It's good that we've all come together and agreed on things, but do they work? Uh, have they been exercised? And I think some of you might recall me saying, as I came into the job, I wanted to 
operationalized the, the Arctic Council, which a lot of people, I guess, didn't quite understand. But what my meaning was is I thought that we had to get beyond meeting in, meetings in rooms and sitting and talking and negotiating and actually acting on some of these things. Now, the Arctic Council is not an operational body. I understand that. But I was very pleased and gratified and, and uh, approved of uh, the formation of the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. Uh, the United States invited, uh, later on, under the auspices of the forum, they invited eight, the eight Arctic states and subject matter experts and the tourism industry to a tabletop exercise in Anchorage last fall that simulated a search and rescue emergency in the Arctic. The exercise called Arctic Zephyr was a U.S.-led effort to support the implementation of the 2011 agreement. And we'll exercise it again this summer with a full-scale operational search and rescue demonstration off the northern shores of Alaska. The value of these things is getting people working and talking together. Uh, one of the things that I've observed over the course of my career that we are better off when we're communicating with each other, and we're also better off if that we're not meeting people face to face the first time in an emergency. So these exercises are very important to carrying these agreements to their next step. Another piece of good news is that last month, that 2013 oil spill prevention and preparedness agreement officially went into effect, ensuring strong cooperation among the Arctic states in the event of an oil spill emergency in Arctic waters. In support of this agreement, the United States recently hosted a workshop where participants created a library of potential scenarios that would trigger a shared response to an offshore oil spill. This is the first step working towards the tabletop exercise and then hopefully in the future a full-scale operational exercise as well. Given the Arctic Ocean's vast expanse and the complications of containing oil and icy waters, it's essential that we are prepared to work closely with the other Arctic states to respond quickly and efficiently in an emergency. Now, one of the things I also spoke about uh, more than a year ago, and as we came into the chairmanship, is uh, in moving these initiatives forward and gaining acceptance and getting people interested in the Arctic, I was struggling to come up with a national imperative. In the past, investment in the Arctic has always relied upon some sort of national defense issue, whether it was the dew line in the late 50s or other things along the line. Uh, that seems to be the only time that we stimulated investment. Or a tragedy like Exxon Valdez, which then uh, prompted uh, legislation and regulation in the form of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. But what would it take during a period of calm and peace to inspire people to be interested in the Arctic? Well, the president came up with it, and it's climate change. Now, climate change worldwide is an initiative for the president and is one of his legacy issues, but nowhere is this demonstrated more and with more severe impact than in the Arctic. So one of the key Arctic priorities is that we're focusing on the impacts of climate change. And the Arctic, as many of you know, as in fact probably all of you in this room know, is warming twice as fast as the global average. The National Snow and Ice Data Center just announced this year that the maximum winter sea ice extent covering the Arctic Ocean was the smallest ever. When it comes to sea ice, it seems that we are rapidly losing ground and losing the battle. Many marine mammals and Arctic species are dependent upon ice for hunting, fishing, and breeding. Most significantly, sea ice is critical for the people living in the Arctic. The indigenous and local communities that have depended on Arctic ice for generations as a source of food and probably even more important as protection. Because in the Arctic, ice has, affected, uh, has acted as a natural barrier, sheltering the coast from hostile seas. Without this protection, Alaska shorelines are now eroding, some retreating in tens of feet per year, causing homes and villages to slide into the ocean and forcing coastal communities to relocate. Climate change impacts are so acute in the Arctic, in part because pollutants like black carbon have a profound effect locally. Emissions of climate pollutants originating in the Arctic countries and neighboring states can become trapped in the immediate atmosphere magnifying their local and harmful impacts. For this reason, the United States is now leading an Arctic Council expert group on black carbon and methane. And I'm pleased with the progress that the group is making. 
Every Arctic state and several observers recently provided reports on their national black carbon and methane emissions to the Arctic Council Secretariat. And the Secretariat uh, will then help us to better understand the role that this uh, pollution is playing in the Arctic and uh, its involvement in the warming that's going on. As you can see, we've had a very busy and I think very productive year, but there's still considerable work to be done. We're looking forward to completing negotiations on a legally binding, in fact, this will be the third legally binding agreement in Arctic Council history, uh, one that will enhance scientific cooperation in the Arctic, which we expect the Arctic states will officially sign at our ministerial and Fairbanks next year. Through the Rising Sun Initiative, we're also working with our Arctic partners to determine what's working best in suicide prevention in the region and seeking ways to evaluate our progress in promoting mental wellness in the Arctic. Over the next year, we'll also lead a discussion on advancing Arctic marine cooperation, assessing our needs for international partnerships to meet future opportunities and challenges in the Arctic Ocean. In fact, the United States is shepherding to completion a host of initiatives that are currently in progress within the Council. However, in the year ahead, I'm committing to ensuring that we make significant progress on more than just projects. I'm also focused on advancing our broader chairmanship goals so we shape U.S. and international Arctic work long after the Arctic Council uh, passes chairmanship to Finland. One of our highest priorities continues to be raising awareness domestically about the Arctic. The United States is an Arctic nation. A year ago when we began our chairmanship, there seemed to be little consciousness outside of Alaska of the Arctic's impact on our country. To reaffirm our Arctic identity and to demonstrate that the Arctic is relevant for all Americans, we recently launched a blog called Our Arctic Nation. Each week, the medium features firsthand accounts of an American representing a different state who explains the Arctic's relationship to her or his community. In the four months since the blog's launch, I've learned about innovative cold climate design initiatives in Virginia. Michigan's influence on reindeer herding practices in Alaska, and the efforts of the Midwest to increase diversity in Arctic exploration and cold water sports, or cold weather sports. Probably the most compelling entries have been written by those related to the impact of a warming Arctic and what is uh, occurring on our communities outside of Alaska. The imminent threat of sea level rise compelled Dr. Colin Polsky to write his entry entitled where the Arctic goes, there goes Miami. It's a sobering story, to say the least, but one of many sobering stories that I've seen, observed, read, and experienced myself over the past year. Next week, he and his colleagues will host in Fort Lauderdale an important conference looking at how melting Arctic glaciers will define Florida's future. Our friends in the Sunshine State truly understand that the Arctic is directly connected to their fate. To draw more attention to the people of the Arctic, the more than four million people whose lives and cultures are rooted in the region, we're also, also shining a spotlight on the amazing young people of the region. We're doing this through the Arctic Youth Ambassadors Program, a joint initiative of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Alaska Geographic, and the Department of State. This two-year program is providing 22 young Alaskans a platform to share with the world their experiences of living on the top of the globe. I've been lucky to meet these students several times over the, past, uh, over the last year, and I've been extraordinarily impressed by their depth and their experience and their firm commitment to Arctic issues. Brianna Riley, for example, is focused on promoting wellness, suicide prevention, and healthy lifestyles to northern villagers such as hers. Byron Nikolai, a resident of Tuxuk Bay, has tens of thousands of followers on social media because of his Yupik singing and dancing skills. Now, these are just a couple of the many powerful voices that we've been proud to amplify because we know their thoughts and experiences can positively shape and influence international communities' view of the Arctic while also demonstrating some of the obstacles and opportunities facing the region. In addition to raising awareness domestically about the Arctic, a key component of international strategy is preparing the next generation to tackle the important challenges that we're facing in the Arctic. Through the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, 
the United States is sponsoring 17 scholars across the Arctic who are participating in an 18-month study program that supports cutting-edge research on energy, water, health, and infrastructure issues. Upon finishing their program, these scholars will disseminate their policy-relevant recommendations, describing the concrete steps that they've taken toward addressing the key issues facing the region. The Fulbright Arctic Initiative is a model of how action in the Arctic should be informed by research and local engagement. So the question that uh, Brookings posed for this particular event today is, where do we go from here? And that's closely related to our remaining two goals for the Arctic Council Chairmanship. As I said earlier, we had three o overarching goals. One was raising awareness, but the other two are important here for the future. And the first is ensuring the legacy and longevity of the Arctic Council. And number two, launching new initiatives that have long-term impacts for the Arctic. In September, the Arctic Council will celebrate its 20th anniversary. In anticipating this milestone, we sometimes ask ourselves, where would we be today if the Arctic Council did not exist? Preparing the Arctic's future requires careful strategic planning and a shared commitment to peaceful international cooperation. And I believe the Arctic Council is helping to make this possible. The types of conversations that are ongoing in the Council, despite geopolitical shifts elsewhere, ensure that the Arctic will endure as a stable region. Without the Arctic Council, there would be no place for a dialogue where peaceful cooperation generates great progress. We're committed to ensuring the Arctic Council continues to be a relevant and vital forum and the premier Arctic forum at that. We're working to strengthen the Council by promoting long-term strategic planning, advancing a comprehensive financial review, and facilitating the meaningful engagement of the observer states that uh, volunteer to step forward and be a part of the Arctic Council. In October, for instance, we hosted a half-day special session that provided the Council's more than 30 accredited observers an unprecedented forum to engage with the Arctic states, permanent participants, and the working group leads. The Arctic Council also approved an addendum to its observer's manual that provides clearer guidance on how observers can contribute substantially to the work of the Arctic Council. So looking forward, we're focused on advancing new initiatives that will have long-term positive impacts. I, for one, and uh, it's probably safe for me to say this, uh, I think we've been focused too much over the last decade or so on these two-year intervals of chairmanship a program is proposed, uh, and then at the end of two years, we hoist the flag and say mission accomplished, and then we start over again with a new cycle of program initiatives. So one of the things that we did right from the start was pick program initiatives that we hoped would be longstanding. And sometimes it's very difficult then at intervals like mid-chairmanship or even the end of chairmanship to say, to point out all the concrete achievements that have been done. But I think it's important that we have long-lasting uh, efforts that other countries agree to, and that was a part of our process as we did this. So over the next year, we'll complete, our, we'll complete with our Arctic partners a circumpolar infrastructure assessment that will lead to recommendations for how the Arctic states can move forward with enhancing telecommunications capacity to meet end-user needs. Building telecommunications infrastructure across the Arctic is critical for addressing the growing communications needs and the demands of Arctic residents and for supporting navigation, offshore development activities, search and rescue operations, and environmental and humanitarian emergencies. There are significant telecommunication gaps in the Arctic, which is why this robust initiative includes close collaboration with the newly launched Arctic Economic Council and will hopefully continue into the Finnish chairmanship. We're also focused on the Arctic as a rich, renewable energy source. Many Arctic communities are heavily reliant on costly diesel generation for home heating, electricity, and transportation. In remote regions, access to clean energy is about, is about so much more than simply reducing pollution. It's also about reducing costs for the families that live within the Arctic and re relieving families of the heavy financial burden caused by high fuel and home heating expenses. Sustainable economic development in these communities is dependent on diversification of energy supply and improved access to clean, reliable, affordable sources of energy. 
Within the Arctic Council, we're also spearheading the Arctic Remote Energy Networks Academy, or ARENA as it's called. ARENA is a long-term project to train local leaders about alternative energy opportunities. To better understand the region's energy potential, we're also creating an online map of circumpolar solar, geothermal, hydro, and other renewable resources. Renewables, combined with abundant fossil fuels available in the region, will ensure the Arctic's long-term vitality and prosperity. While the President spoke out at COP and drew attention to uh, the climate and the challenges that we're facing and uh, also directed attention to the Arctic, but now that COP21 is behind us, the work continues, and we must address the impacts of climate change, and it's more important than ever, as there may be no issue with greater long-term consequences for the Arctic. The Arctic Council is looking at what a two degree Celsius temperature increase globally would look like for the Arctic so that we can prepare for its impacts. We're also framing our climate discussions around resilience, considering how our climate discussions around uh, res uh, also framing our climate discussions around resilience, considering how Arctic communities will respond to the changes rapidly occurring around them. Approximately 100,000 Alaskans. 14% of the state's population live in areas that's sensitive to permafrost thaw. And many of these residents are faced with a difficult and costly need to re relocate. It's essential that we identify, understand, and respond to the climate changes occurring across the region so that we may build resilient communities and avoid crossing what may be dangerous tipping points. So as a lifelong sailor, as I said in the beginning, my thoughts are often framed by the sea and my many experiences there. And when I think of the Arctic and its future, I can't help but think back to that uh, Nimitz letter that I told you about up front. Now, Nimitz wrote that letter as a review of an investigation of an accident that occurred during World War II. In December of 1944, uh, Admiral Bull Halsey was in charge of the fleet which was supporting the invasion of the Philippines. And uh, his people not only had uh, somewhat questionable weather information during that time, uh, but they also had almost a sole focus on conducting combat operations, which is understandable. Uh, they ran the ships hard, and by the time they realized uh, the weather that was bearing down on them, they had to refuel a lot of the smaller ships, and uh, they waited too long. Uh, so consequently, 800 sailors were lost, three destroyers sunk, 200 badly needed fighter aircraft were destroyed and had to be pushed overboard from the aircraft carriers. It was the worst loss the Navy had in non-combat operations. In fact, even worse than some of the combat operations during World War II. So uh, a very thorough investigation was done, and then Chester Nimitz wrote a letter which uh, is shared amongst sailors almost everywhere, it was given to me by my commanding officer when I reported aboard. And uh, for many years, uh, the, the Naval Institute put out a book uh, called Command at Sea, and Nimitz's letter is in there as well. And I'm not going to read you the entire letter, but uh, the germane points of it is, uh, Admiral Nimitz advised that those faced with a catastrophe and the need to act, that you needed to act as soon as possible before the crisis actually begins at the first sign. In the letter, there's a quote that I always remember. It said, there's no little red light which is going to flash and inform commanding officers or higher commanders that from then on there is extreme danger. He wrote, the time for taking all measures for safety is while you're still able to do so. So as we look at the Arctic, there's not going to be any little red light flashing telling us about the immediate needs for action in the Arctic. But the time to act is now. By putting in place today necessary infrastructure, policies, strategies, we'll create an Arctic that will continue to thrive despite any environmental and political challenges that may arise. Preparing the Arctic's future will require careful strategic planning and a shared commitment to peaceful international cooperation so that the vitality of this very important region will endure for generations. I'm here to tell you that the United States is committed, and we're committed beyond the United States chairmanship, to working with our Arctic partners to guarantee that this special region is prepared for the opportunities 
and the challenges that are before it. Together, we're moving in the right direction. International cooperation and diplomacy will ensure that when greater challenges arise, we will be staged to solve them together. And therein lies the value of the Arctic Council, talking, working, and cooperating together peacefully to sustain this really important and vital region of our world. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the uh, question and answer and discussions that we'll have following this. Thank you, Admiral Papp, for that very interesting overview. And I think your last message was perhaps one of the best I've ever heard. Uh, the time to act is before the crisis comes, not when you're either in the middle of it or deep into it. I just have a few questions, so I wanted to start our discussion, then we'll go to the audience. Do you feel that with the uh, decision by Shell uh, to pull out of Alaska, that this uh, has reduced interest in the Arctic. Uh, I mean, I know there's lots of NGOs and other uh, exciting groups doing good things, but at a national level, do you think it's kind of gone away from kind of official Washington at all because of the, of the reduced interest in the region, at least economically? Well, I would say practically, uh, I'm worried that it has. Uh, I'm, I'm worried that it's reduced the sense of urgency. And I also would add that uh, when Shell made the announcement, I had just arrived in Fairbanks, Alaska for the Arctic uh, Energy Summit. Uh, the first meeting was the next morning in the Carlson Center, and I can remember that the MC at the beginning of the meeting uh, announced or uh, passed on the announcement by Shell and then called for a moment of silence. Now, you, you can read a lot of things into that. You know, first is maybe lamenting the lack of uh, or the loss of potential prosperity, uh, a share in the resources, uh, further development and, uh, and uh, economic uh, incentives within the Arctic. Uh, but I also think that there was some sense in the room that Shell, because of its activities, was providing an incentive uh, for the United States to be concerned and to be involved uh, in the Arctic in terms of preparing and uh, coming up with resources to do it. Now, some of that might be uh, shadowed or influenced by my own personal thoughts, uh, because I know when I came in as Commandant of the Coast Guard in 2010, uh, Shell was in the process of making preparations. One of the first trips I made was to Alaska, to Anchorage, where I met with Shell, BP, and, and others uh, to get a sense of uh, the magnitude of the operations that would be going on. And uh, at that time, once again, as a consequence manager, as someone who had the responsibility for providing safety and security, I wanted to make sure the Coast Guard was prepared. Uh, but the Coast Guard is just a microcosm of the country in general. Uh, you know, the Coast Guard certainly needs to provide icebreakers, uh, aircraft, and other things, but uh, the country needs to have uh, better deep water ports uh, or a deep water port in Alaska, uh, better telecommunications, uh, a whole uh, list of issues that we need to be prepared for. And I thought that uh, the fact that uh, Shell was going to be operating up there provided sort of that sent, uh, incentive and drew attention. So I, I was sorry to see it pass. It just makes it harder for us, uh, for those of us in the room and, and myself uh, to continue to raise awareness and, and gain that focus. What I, would, what I would also add is just a, a, a follow-on to that response is Shell was not my only concern, nor should I think Shell or any other oil company drilling in the Arctic should be the primary concern because the reality is there are ships that are passing through the Bering Strait each and every day carrying fuel. And uh, as has been demonstrated in the past, 
it's probably more likely that a ship's going to lose power, run aground, or get caught in a storm uh, and, and driven up on a beach. Uh, maybe not causing as much of a spill as, uh, as a blown out oil well, if that were to occur. But what I will tell you is that any oil spill is bad. It doesn't matter what kind of oil, how large, how small, any oil spill anywhere is bad, and it's particularly bad in the Arctic. So sort of a long-winded response to the question that I am, I am discouraged uh, that, that Shell is not going to be drilling up there in the near future because it was, you know, it, was, it was a visible, something that really drew a lot of attention, which provided that sense of urgency to act. Thank you. Another question that comes up frequently uh, is with the tense state of U.S. Uh, and European relations with Russia in the wake of the Ukrainian invasion, has that, in your view, adversely affected how the Russians and the Americans and others can cooperate in the Arctic? I, I would say it's impossible, it, it's impossible to ignore uh, Russia's <coughs> activities in Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. Uh, it certainly overshadowed our efforts as we developed our chairmanship program. I think, as I mentioned, uh, those, those first six comments that I most frequently got, number three was, what about Russia? Uh, we spent a lot of time talking, what about Russia? And uh, what I think we've been able to do is we've been able to segregate, isolate proper sanctions for their activities in Ukraine, and continue cooperation in the Arctic. Uh, there, there, is certain, there is certainly some tension from time to time and sensitivities, but I would say that the people, the, the Russians that we were dealing with in Arctic issues are, are very professional, thorough, cooperative. Uh, Vladimir Barbin, who's the senior Arctic official, when I traveled to the other seven countries to present our program, he gave me the most thorough, detailed, constructive evaluation of our chairmanship program of any other country. And he has continued to be a very significant and forceful uh, participant uh, within the Arctic Council uh, evolutions. And I think it's a testament to the Arctic Council that even uh, during times of, of crisis uh, and tensions elsewhere, we're able to maintain peace and stability and make forward progress on the initiatives that the Arctic Council has taken on. Just one final question, then we'll go to the floor. Could you bring us up to date on uh, what has happened uh, on the whole concept of uh, creating marine protected areas kind of across the Arctic? Uh, yes. Uh, two of our initiatives, uh, one is a regional seas agreement, which, uh, as I found out now that I are a diplomat, uh, is, uh, there's, there's a lot to be read into what is a regional seas agreement. Uh, and, and there's a menu of things you can pick from, which may include, uh, as part of it, marine protected areas, or that can be a, a, an entirely separate issue. So we, we believe that uh, there should be some sort of regional seas agreement that we all can agree with uh, the components of that are still under negotiation, and we're, we're working on that. We're trying to move that forward. Uh, however, marine protected areas, uh, that, that is a, a red flag for certain countries. Uh, uh, countries certainly don't like to be told that portions of their sovereign waters might be off limits to something. I can tell you that there's one state in the United States that doesn't like to be told that certain <laughs> portions of its, uh, its waters are going to be closed to certain activities. On the other hand, uh, we have a bowhead whale corridor uh, off the North Slope. Uh, that was determined using both science and traditional knowledge of the indigenous peoples to set aside an area off the coast where there would be no drilling, no, uh, no activity. Now, when I look at it, it sure looks like, sounds like, smells like a marine protected area, but, but we call it, you know, it, it, by another name. So I think the concept of a marine protected area is not necessarily bad. You, you don't want to overuse that. 
But I also think there are areas, there are certain pristine areas that you probably don't want to have a lot of activity, whether it's shipping or oil drilling or whatever else. I, I think there can be a balance in uh, economic activity leading towards prosperity while still preserving areas that are deserving of it as well. Thank you. Okay, we'll now go to the floor. We have roving mics, so bear with us until we can get a mic to you. Uh, please, uh, when you ask the question, uh, preferably make it a question, and please uh, begin by identifying uh, who you are with. Yes, sir. Admiral, thank you very much for a good presentation. My name is Elliot Hurwitz. I'm a former State Department and World Bank and Intelligence Community person. I actually worked with uh, Admiral Bud Zumwalt in the 1980s. Um, I, I have an interest in World War II history, and I'd like to ask you, Admiral, did Soviet icebreakers traverse northern Asia during World War II? Well, I don't have an answer for that. What I do know is, and this is just interesting, something that I feel obliged to point out, is that uh, during World War II, the United States built eight icebreakers. They were called the Wind Class, W-I-N-D. Uh, North Wind, East Wind, South Wind, uh, West Wind. Of course, we ran out of the four winds, and they wanted to build more, so they built uh, a disco, uh, Burton Island, uh, and I can't remember the other, but uh, one was Glacier. And uh, that's why we named it the Glacier Conference when we had it in, in Alaska. That was my subliminal message. We needed to build icebreakers. But we'll, what I will point out is that they didn't have to come up with those other names because we loaned icebreakers to the Russians. So those icebreakers the Russians were using were uh, U.S. icebreakers of the wind class that were transferred from the United States Coast Guard to the Russians during World War II. Where they operated, where they broke ice, I, I just don't know. I'm certain we could do some research on that. Yes. Marjorie Mendel Sambals or Georgetown University. Uh, thank you for your comments about Russia because that was indeed on my mind in terms of their cooperation. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more, including on how they have been cooperating with issues of indigenous peoples in the region. Well, I think as, uh, as we had our discussion before the session began uh, this morning, uh, RIPON, uh, the Russian Association of Indigenous uh, People of the North, uh, continues to participate. Uh, there are concerns about how leadership is elected and who participates, and we continue to deal with that and address that uh, within, within the uh, activities of the Arctic Council. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, as soon as you, you mentioned uh, RIPON, was there another portion of that question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th that's something that I don't have visibility into internally. Uh, once again, because of the, uh, the challenges, the sanctions, and everything else, uh, we have not participated greatly and activities inside of Russia. Uh, I was allowed one visit to Moscow at the beginning of the chairmanship. Uh, we have sent some people from our embassy to some of the, the larger events uh, that have occurred, but uh, we, we have not, I would say, within the Arctic-related activities, not the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council, we have uh, had full cooperation and, and working together. Uh, but some of the other non-Arctic Council, Arctic conferences and other things, we have not been sending uh, any senior officials to attend there, so uh, we don't have a lot of insight into exactly how they're dealing politically uh, with their indigenous people. Thank you, Max. Karen Schroeder, Strategy Execution Consultant. Um, you mentioned the red light that, that 
ideally would go on, surely that would have gone on about 20 years ago. We're well into emergency circumstances in the Arctic, as you mentioned. Um, is the Arctic Council working on, on reducing the amount of drilling that is going to take place um, in the shelves that are opening up for, that, that are becoming more accessible? We know that we need to keep that carbon in the ground, in you know, under the sea. Um, is the U.S. working actively toward reducing the propensity to be drilled there? You know, I think the United States is uh, trying to come up with a balanced energy program, uh, certainly encouraging the use of uh, renewables as much as we can. Uh, even funding some of that, and, and we're seeing significant increase, whether it's solar, uh, uh, wind, hydro, thermal. Uh, we're making good advancements. Uh, I, one of the things I mention uh, when I speak to groups is, uh, and I don't know whether this group will be the same, but uh, if I speak to an environmental group, uh, I, I receive maybe not direct criticism, but I can remember vividly uh, during Q&A uh, in front of one of the environmental groups a year ago, and this was after the president uh, had, had been involved in, in negotiations and the Interior Department was looking at renewing leases, et cetera, and uh, the person that rose in hand said, I'm so disappointed with, with your president, uh, which I said, well, it's our president, not, not my president, it's our president. And I said, why are you disappointed? He says, well, because the president is opening up the Arctic to everybody. I went and spoke to a group of uh, uh, industry people. Uh, uh, about a week later, the guy raised his hand. I'm so disappointed with your president. And I went through the same thing. I said, why are you disappointed? He says, well, he's closing down the Arctic to everybody. So, you know, I, if, if you go by the rule, you're not pleasing everybody. The president's probably found the sweet spot. Uh, and I'm not trying to be funny. What I'm saying is there, there is a wide and diverse number of opinions on what we should be doing. Uh, I, I don't accept as gospel that we have to leave all the carbon in the ground. I mean, that, that's certainly a statement made by people, but uh, there are other opinions on that as well. The fact of the matter is the world, unless we come up immediately with, a, with another energy source, is going to continue to be dependent upon uh, carbon products. What we what we're obliged to do is find a cleaner way of doing that. I mean, a, a practical way of dealing with it. I am convinced that human beings can make a change. I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing in Paris. Is it is that little red light on? Yes. I I, I think that red light is on, and we we ought to be acting quicker. But there's also practical considerations that policymakers, politicians, and other people have to deal with on a regular basis. Uh, the the divergent views of various groups have to be brought together and find common purpose to start working forward on, on solutions. I was talking to Charlie on the, on the way in here, and uh, I, I, I remain a firm believer that we as human beings can make a difference. And, and maybe it's a smaller issue, but I, I tell the story of going into New York Harbor in 1970 and looking at all the pollution in the harbor and thinking how terrible this is, and I can recall at the same time the people saying that uh, nothing can be done about it. You know, we can't possibly get all our communities along the Hudson River and the East River to stop dumping their sewage. It's too expensive. You know, there's, there's just no solution to this. Well, policymakers, uh, politicians came up with the Clean Water Act of 1973. And 10 years later, when I was assigned to a ship in New York Harbor, the, the harbor was substantially cleaner. And if you go to New York Harbor today, you can swim in it. You can eat fish out of it. And uh, the biggest challenge we're facing now is the wood-eating worms have returned and are eating the piles on the piers and, and, and around the city. So uh, I don't know if that's an apt uh, analogy right there, but, but I know it was a huge problem. The Clean Air Act, a, a similar thing. We, we are much better today because of those things. So the first step is getting people together. And by golly, look at the number of countries that went to Paris. Uh, a decade ago, you would have never got that many countries together. The United States has demonstrated leadership by going to China, getting China involved. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people that are disappointed that we're not moving faster. All of us would like to see us moving faster to make this a better place. But I'll accept the fact that we are at least making progress and not stepping back as a good sign.
Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Admiral. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I'd like to follow up on this energy question. I'm the Icelandic ambassador here in D.C., and we are very interested in renewable energy, sustainable energy. Uh, I was at that energy conference where you, which you mentioned, uh, Admiral Pap, and uh, I noticed up there that uh, people were very frustrated with the, the price of, of fuel. $2 a gallon in D.C., $3 in Anchorage, $4 in Fairbanks, $8 a gallon up north. So it's a real economic issue, like you pointed out. But my question is, is there any specific timeline in terms of doing the substitution? And is there any goal in terms of, you know, what level you can reach? You know, we are at 99% in terms of geothermal for house heating, for example. Is there any realistic goal that people are working towards in this area? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank... Uh, Ambassador Gail Hardy for being here. He's a, a good friend uh, to our Arctic Council efforts. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to get to know him a, a little bit over the last uh, two years. And uh, I also uh, have enjoyed my visits to uh, Iceland, to Reykjavik, and uh, much longer stories about that and, and, and maritime issues. Uh, uh, and maybe we can respond to other questions that relate to that. But what I say, one of the solutions might be to move more people to Iceland and enjoy that 99% thermal energy up there. I, I've always, uh, I've, during my visits to Reykjavik, I've always remarked and, uh, how wonderful it is to have that resource. I guess except when the volcano blows. It, you have second thoughts about it. But, uh, but uh, to get back to your question, a any of this requires resourcing. Uh, whether, whether you're talking about telecommunications in the Arctic, changing over to new sources of energy, uh, building a deep water port in, in northern Alaska, all these are new starts. And, you know, there's a couple of unfortunate things that, as I took on this challenge, as the United States takes on the challenge of U.S. chairmanship, you know, the Russia issue first and foremost, the, the country that we probably depend upon the most for moving things forward, who, who owns half the coastline of Alaska, uh, we're having geopolitical challenges with in other areas of the world. Uh, the other thing is economy. Uh, we, are, we are at a point where, for the U.S. economy, we're not growing. There are certainly a lot of infrastructure challenges across the United States. So anything in the Arctic, anything that you want to do in Alaska, is a new start. If you want to do a new start during a non-growth period, you've got to stop doing something else. And there are a lot of constituencies that like to see their programs continue. So uh, it, it's a challenge. So I think you need to provide incentives for public-private partnerships. Where is the incentive to get industry to start investing, training people? You have to take a longer-term focus. And right now, I think, unfortunately, we have a short-term focus. How do we get through the next budget cycle? How do we get the economy uh, uh, going again? And there's not a lot of strategic thought being given to long-term. I mentioned Reykjavik, and I, I know you've heard me tell the story uh, in many venues. Uh, when I'm talking primarily about maritime future uh, with the Arctic and the new sea routes that are opening up, uh, one of the, uh, the things that I noted early on was Singapore showing up at a lot of conferences on the Arctic. And when I, when I finally talked to them about it, it's because they're concerned about losing their strategic location as a transshipment point. Uh, that transshipment point could possibly be uh, Reykjavik or somewhere in Iceland in the future if everybody starts going across the pole. So uh, the reason... Singapore is doing that it's because they have a long-term focus. They, uh, they know that their business, government, is business. They want prosperity for their people. And if their business lines might change, they're willing to invest in, in a potential future with the long view in mind. And what I'm saying is I, I'm, I'm not comfortable that we here in this city are always focused on the long view and that we need to be making investments now to be prepared for 10, 20, and 30 years from now. 
And that going back to the first question you asked, well, you know, what does shell pulling out do it? Well, it, it removes one of those incentives for us to feel a sense of urgency uh, to start making investments in all those things, including renewable energy. Back on the, on the back there. We'll, get, we'll try to get to everybody. We've got some time. Just uh, Mary Klein, I mentioned from Longview Global Advisor. Um, yeah. I wanted, on that point, I wanted to get your insight or opinion about the Arctic Investment Protocol that was put together at WEF at Davos last January. If you think that's a good first step to bringing all those disparate groups together, providing some uh, incentives to bring in the investment but also do it sustainably. Uh, I'll start off by saying I don't have in-depth knowledge and study on it. Uh, certainly, the, the fact that it is being talked about and, uh, and was part of Davos was very important to us. I think it goes back to what I was talking about here. Uh, we, we need uh, – there's very few governments in the world that on their own uh, can take on these new challenges uh, with, without – stopping other programs or uh, uh, terminating things that are important to other people as well. So if there's no strong growth in the economy, you've got to either stop doing things or look for other innovative programs, bringing those desperate groups together and, and finding investment. We had a gentleman, I think on this side, yes. I think it was Ray. Yeah, yeah. I can't see. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Ray Pomerantz from Arctic 21. Uh, I just wanted to offer a word of uh, support for something you said about the, how the U.S. is at the moment conducting the chairmanship, which is its focus on continuity and planning over the long term. And I think the more I gather is sort of a, also a bigger picture look, like you mentioned that the Arctic Council is going to look at what the Arctic looks like in a two-degree warming global scenario. Of course, the Arctic would be about five degrees centigrade warmer. But this is, seems like a slight, you know, new approach in the Arctic Council that's extremely important. And uh, so my question was uh, just sort of a, what you see going forward, how this is. I know that Ambassador Bolton shared a session, I believe, at the last SAO meeting, kind of focused on this big picture. How do you see this sort of continuity big picture going forward? Well, it, it plays into the broader issue of thinking strategically and long-term. You know, something that I continue to emphasize. Um, I, I, I feel badly about continuing to go back to uh, my Coast Guard experience, but my Coast Guard experience is my Coast Guard experience. My experience as a sailor is my experience. And... Uh, were introduced very, very early in our careers to strategic planning. Uh, the Coast Guard uh, has a program called Evergreen, uh, which proposes world scenarios out at the 25-year point, various world scenarios, and then there's a process you go through on how, what you would do, what decisions you would make today based upon those various world scenarios, and then you look for common features across them all in order to decide where you're going to set your priorities, where you're going to spend your budget, uh, discretionary budget, et, et cetera. So for me, it was natural coming into the Arctic Council, okay, why are we doing this two-year cycle? You know, why do we have to rush to completion so that we can sit down and make this declaration in, in Nuke, Callaway, Fairbanks, whatever it might be? You know, surely there's probably going to be some flagship enterprise. For us, it's the Arctic uh, Science Cooperation Agreement that we're working on. But all the rest of those things, we, we don't want to see them drop. You know, one of my, one of my visits in January uh, was to Helsinki to sit down uh, with our Finnish partners and, and encourage them uh, to continue the projects that we've begun under our chairmanship. We hate to see them drop off. They're, I mean, I... I can't think of a single project that we have ongoing right now uh, that I would be willing to see sacrificed as we go to the next chairmanship. That we just need to continue a lot of these things. And uh, so how do you encourage people to do it? You've got to start thinking strategically. You've got to stop thinking between, okay, two years from now, finish chairmanship. Two years beyond that, another chairmanship. We need to be thinking out 20, 30, and 40 years from now. Where do we want to be? What needs to be done? 
and how do those projects that we've taken up fit into that, uh, that world that we're advancing to. And if they don't fit, then drop them. But if they are important to that future, we need to devote resources towards it. Over on the side. Uh, thank you, Admiral, for uh, those remarks. My name is David Condino, and uh, Admiral, I work for the organization that you uh, head, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, as a civilian. Uh, um, and um, I, I, I'd like to just ask a question about um, the work of um, the International Maritime Organization as it relates to Arctic Council work. Uh, we know that uh, the um, uh, Polar Code... Um, is coming into force uh, very soon, uh, first of the year, uh, 2017. Uh, and the Arctic Council, not being a regulatory body, not being uh, an organization that has a treaty, uh, does a lot of great work. Um, I have heard, and I work on one of the, uh, I, I'm on one of the delegations to the work group, uh, one of the work groups, uh, the Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment, uh, team. Uh, uh, so, uh, I also work on the um, uh, on the uh, supporting the IMO delegations, which are headed up by uh, the Coast Guard. How uh, the, the question is: How can the work uh, that is being done uh, at uh, the Arctic Council? How do you feel that can best uh, support, help with implementation of uh, those regulations that will be coming into effect uh, within MARPOL? Uh, uh, how can it help uh, the IMO put those into effect, especially in light of, and you mentioned um, uh, IMO being an organization that uh, everybody can contribute to, every country, and especially country like, like countries like Ch China. Uh, very interested. Those countries are in preserving their rights uh, to uh, um, transpolar routes and, and, and so forth, et cetera. No, I have to admit, personally, in my own experience, and I, I headed, I used to head the delegation uh, to the International Maritime Organization, and uh, from a purely parochial standpoint, as I went to IMO, now six years ago, I guess it was, when I, when I did my first uh, uh, assembly meeting, uh, in fact, both times I went, I, I gathered together the other seven countries of the Arctic Council because I was looking, while I was there, to conduct other business and say, okay, Canada, uh, we have the potential for four years of North American leadership of the Arctic Council. And, you know, me, I'm in a very narrow view. I want to get icebreakers built and, and other infrastructure, whatever. I'm looking to draw attention. And uh, what I found out was that I really didn't understand the Arctic Council. I, I sort of understood the IMO, which is a chartered body of the United Nations, and it has uh, a very uh, strict and uh, rules of procedure, etc., as does the United Nations. And what I didn't realize was this term international forum, which is what the Arctic Council is. Uh, the Arctic Council is a voluntary organization of the countries that have responsibilities within the Arctic. I don't know if it's unique, but it's unique in my experience in looking at bodies around the world. And one of the things that I've been concerned about over the past year is there are a lot of people who come forward who would like to change the Arctic Council. Let's inject uh, defense considerations into the Arctic Council. Let's make it uh, more of a business uh, organization. And, and what I what I think is, it, it's just like when you say the word marine protected areas, you're going to lose somebody immediately. What I'm concerned about is, even during the Cold War, even 20 years ago, even when Finland in the early 90s uh, started the uh, Arctic Environmental Protection Initiative, we had the Soviet Union then, now Russia, the Russian Federation, at the table as a full partner. You start injecting NATO or EU, uh, you know, defense or economic organizations into the, the dealings of the Arctic Council, I think you lose immediately one very important member. Because you can't move things forward in the Arctic Council without the consensus of all eight nations. And oh, by the way, if you've got a, if you've got a partner in there the size of Russia, 
owning as much territory in the Arctic as it owns. Uh, I, I think you'd rather have them in there communicating peacefully and, and operating and trying to move things forward. So any, any structural change to the Arctic Council, I think we can, we can nibble around the edges and we have, you know, in terms of observer participation and other things. But uh, I, I think at the end of the day, the purity of the Arctic Council and the fact that it's a group of volunteers coming together, I think brings force. I, I don't know if you want to call it moral suasion, but in terms of influencing their countries and every other country at IMO is going to look, well, what do the countries of the Arctic think about this before they start moving things forward on a polar code or, or something like that? So I don't know if moral suasion is the right word, but what I think is that there's a purity to the fact that you are a voluntary group that has come together for a specific issue uh, that is unique in the world and can have influence, and, and that is the manner in which I see the Arctic Council operating in terms of issues like the Polar Code and others. Why don't we take two questions that are closely to that? Thank you very much, and thank you for that very interesting presentation. My name is Patricia Benneke, and I'm the regional director of, uh, for the United Nations Environment Program here in North America. We're located in Farragut Square. Um, UNEP is an official observer of the Arctic Council. Uh, we attend many of the meetings, the ministerial and also uh, SAO meetings and the like. And I was wondering what your vision is for observers off into the future, and how can we be most constructive in supporting the efforts of the Council? Yes, well, observers, and first of all, no offense on any comments about the UN. I, okay, good, good, good. I, 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 wasn't, uh, I wasn't suggesting that the, the UN was uh, anything less because of structure and, and rules or anything. Uh, I think anybody that brings the countries of the world together to talk to each other is, is worthwhile. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, I got sidetracked there. I was thinking about the UN observers. Uh, observers are another beautiful part about this organization. You know, first of all, you've got the eight countries. And I'm sorry if I focused on the eight countries, but even more importantly is you have the six uh, permanent participants, the representatives of the indigenous peoples that, that are there. I have a diagram that I use from time to time, and it's got the countries and, and the six permanent participants together. The outer ring is the observers. Uh, they play a very important role. And, and I think, I would say we're experiencing some issues, problems, challenges with observers right now that are solvable. The, the first part is we're, we're only 20 years old. And in the grand scheme of things, 20 is pretty young. And, uh, and I'm told by some of the people that have been around for a while that you almost had to pay people to be observers when, uh, when we started out 20 years ago. Now we have 32 observers with, I think, the latest count was 16 on the waiting list uh, trying to become a part. And we, we faced some challenges uh, under Canada's chairmanship. And this is not, I, I'm not criticizing Canada, because when you only have two years in the chairmanship and you're trying to deal with various issues, sometimes you can't solve them all. And, and we have some observer issues that need to be solved, part of which is defining what the observers do. And I think if you're asking people to step forward, to be part of the group, and you're also asking them to be on the working groups and task forces and hopefully commit some resources to those issues as well, they deserve to be heard. And, and one of the complaints that I received from observer groups when I was, uh, when we were building up to the Arctic Council was, we come, we're told to sit there and, and listen and keep our mouths shut. I, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but, but I, I don't think it's far from most of the comments that I received. So part of the process, as, as I think you all know, Ambassador David Balton, uh, who's the Assistant Secretary for Oceans and Fisheries, is serving as the chair of the Arctic Council. Uh, a position we get to fill uh, during our chairmanship. I, I'm sorry, the chair of the uh, senior Arctic officials, which is uh, uh, something we, we're allowed to appoint as, uh, as the chair. And uh, I believe he has taken this to new levels of openness and collaboration with the observers. Probably not to the level the observers would like to see it yet, 
but we're moving in that direction. All things are incremental, and I think we're making progress. We're also looking at uh, what are the requirements of observers. Uh, should you just be allowed to be an observer and then you're there in perpetuity? I, I think not. I think uh, it should be based upon performance, participation, and, uh, and also I think we have to make some sort of determination on what is a manageable number of observers as well. In either case, uh, we, we've set as our goal, as a part of that, I, I said the three major goals, awareness, strengthening in the Arctic Council, and long-term uh, objectives. Uh, we've made one of the components of strengthening the Arctic Council uh, on dealing with this observer issue. First of all, clearing the backlog, but also setting some clear, understandable uh, details on what we expect participation to be and uh, and also what we are obliged to give in terms of rights to observers. Yes, we have right there in the middle. Thank you. Um, my name is Bob Rich. I'm uh, Executive Director of the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, and I really appreciated your uh, presentation, Admiral, and, and intrigued by the uh, suggestion that there will be a, a binding agreement around international scientific cooperation, uh, hopefully by uh, 2017. Wondering if you could say a little bit about the complexion of what that agreement might include uh, in broad terms. Um, I know we have all sorts of issues, right? Everything from access to sites, access to par participants, uh, um, lack of coordination of funding between governments. I mean, there's a long list, and I'm wondering what are the kinds of things that are being addressed in that agreement that's being discussed? Well, I think you've uh, listed most of what's in there already. Uh, you probably have some insight to that. I think beyond that, getting into any of the granularity and details is premature for me because we're in negotiations right now. Like anything else that you would like all eight countries to sign up to as a legally binding agreement, uh, you don't want to get ahead of that by saying this is what I think is going to be in it or what should be in it. Uh, what I would say in general is the reason I feel strongly about this particular agreement is it goes back to some of the comments I had earlier. Anytime you can get countries working together, seeing each other face to face, cooperating and sharing, I think is a good thing. Uh, not one country within the Arctic Council can do everything that needs to be done within the Arctic. And when you independently devote resources to something that you can't do completely, you're inefficient. So if each one of the eight countries has levels of uh, scientific research going on, why should the United States be doing X when perhaps Russia is doing X as well? Might we better share information and the work that we're doing on why that, uh, that Russia is not doing, we can share that information, and, and likewise on the countries. And once again, I, I've been accused of oversimplification. I would say that one of my core competencies is oversimplification, and that, that's a part of communication. But, but, you know, you can carry that same theory to a lot of things. The telecommunications effort that we're trying to do. Each one of the countries has some level of telecommunications ca capability, but they're not connected circumpolarly so that everybody can benefit from it. There's plenty of data out there. There's a lot of equipment. The problem is we're just not sharing it with each other. You know, maybe it requires an economic incentive. I, I've made the case publicly that while I believe the United States should be building icebreakers, there is probably enough icebreakers in the world to do all the business we need to do. It's just that they're not distributed and, and shared equally. Uh, I've given the example many times where we share ice breaking services on the Great Lakes with Canada. It's a bilateral, uh, inf well, a semi formal bilateral agreement between two countries uh, that recognizes not everybody has all the resources to do everything we'd like to do. Uh, it's the same for whether it's scientific research, telecommunications, emergency response, et cetera. Uh, every country is operating on its own right now. What we'd like to do is bring countries together so that we can be more efficient and, in the long run, uh, effective. Back. Hi, Admiral Dave Nagel, former VP. This is not an energy question, but about China. Uh, what can you say about uh, China's interest in Arctic issues and their participation so far? Uh, this is not an official statement right here. This is just sort of PAPS theory, as I've had a chance to observe. And, you know, it started out uh, 
once again, I'm sorry, I apologize for this. Going back to my time as Commandant, I'm watching Shui Long operating up in the Arctic. I'm thinking, why does China have one icebreaker when the United States only has one icebreaker that works? And uh, I, I was looking at it from a pure parochial point of view, and I think a lot of the speculation that has gone on has been, uh, is China trying to do a land grab? Are they trying to uh, uh, take advantage of the resources? Are, are they going to be up there making claims on uh, portions of the Arctic? A and the focus was there. I, I, I tend to think that... Uh, China has a longer view, and, uh, and I don't think they see themselves as an Arctic nation, but they benefit from the Arctic. And I think, I think their highest priority right now is they're looking at the sea routes, just like Singapore is. Uh, if Singapore is going to lose its strategic uh, uh, location as a transshipment point, uh, what, what are Singapore's competitors? Well, they're Shanghai and, uh, and Hong Kong. All three of them at various times changed the, the rankings in terms of where's the, uh, the largest container port uh, in the world. So uh, China's probably thinking the same thing. They're just not as openly communicative as the Singaporeans are in terms of wh what their intentions. But, uh, you know, I, I'm reading open press stuff uh, that's talking about uh, China shipping company Costco. Uh, possibly building uh, ice strength and container ships. Uh, we know that uh, energy, uh, that uh, China's uh, economy is fueled by uh, energy resources from Norway. And I think as a practical matter, if you start looking at the potential for carving four, six, eight, ten days off uh, sea transits between the Barents Sea and, and China, there's an economic incentive there. And uh, I, I have seen part of, part of this lecture on maritime history that I give really starts in the Middle Ages with Venice uh, dominating what was the known maritime world at the time, the Mediterranean, and then having to take from the Black Sea or from the, uh, the uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean land routes to India and China, the Silk Road, as they called it. Well, people are starting to refer to the northern sea route above Russia as the new Silk Road. And I think there's a reason for that. It's because uh, China is seeing that as potentially uh, the new means of, uh, of uh, trade with, with northern Europe, with Norway, et cetera, in the future. So that's, that's what my opinion is in terms of uh, China's interests up there. And, and then secondarily, uh, they're a world power. They're an economic power. Uh, they have, you know, they have 2,000 year, uh, at least 2,000 year uh, history of being a great power, and they believe that they should be involved in the weighty issues of the world. That's why they're an observer on, on the Arctic Council, and uh, they speak out pretty forcefully. Maybe in the back, please. Hi, um, my name's Rachel Bishop uh, with the Ocean Conservancy, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping this will get a laugh. Um, I can understand conceptually why uh, you had uh, kind of hoped that Shell would uh, stay in the, uh, the U.S. Arctic and that it might bring some urgency. Um, and I can also appreciate your interest in bringing people together and, and getting people to work their issues out that way. One question that I wondered is, uh, do you see there's any option for the United States, especially uh, with ocean planning, as a way to try and get at some of these issues? And, and if you do, how the heck do we approach that with our, our northernmost uh, states? Okay, if, if I left any confusion, uh, I would say that I was hoping they would continue to drill from a purely selfish and parochial view in terms of, uh, once again, going back when, when I was responsible for trying to uh, generate policy and budgeting interest in building icebreakers and other infrastructure uh, that I felt the United States Coast Guard needed to carry out its duties in an area of the world where the United States has responsibilities, I, I look for imperatives. What, what's the imperative that's going to 
uh, get legislators to act to uh, to provide the national treasure uh, to do new initiatives. So uh, yeah, I'll t- when I was in that position, I- I'll-, I'll take the uh, the attention wherever we can get it. Uh, but like I said, Shell can go away, BP can go away, others. Uh, you know, I'm told it's going to be a while before the oil prices get high enough to uh, in- initiate more. Uh, research and drilling in the Arctic, but ships are going to continue to go into the Arctic. Uh, as I said earlier, the ships are going to continue to pass through the Bering Strait uh, as the, uh, the ocean continues to open and it becomes more feasible economically and physically to, uh, to have major sea routes. The ships will increase uh, unless somebody bans them, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that, I, I, but, but Entrepreneurs. One of the one of the things I've seen in in, in the history of uh, of the maritime is it, it's not fighting. Wars get fought, as uh, Clausewitz said, that it's an extension of politics by another means, because countries their priority is prosperity. How do you connect uh, or create the economic situations uh, that lead to prosperity for your country? And maritime trade has always been one of those things that uh, people have fought over, have competed over. Uh, the Northwest Passage, uh, had, people have been looking for a Northwest Passage for 500 years or more. So uh, this is just a continuation of history. And that, that, I mean, that author that talked about me wanting to spout history, you don't understand where you are unless you study history and, and why things have happened. So people are going to have been looking for these sea routes as I said, for uh, half a millennium, and uh, and they're going to continue to do that. What, what we can only hope to do is to perhaps provide regulation. It's like we, we got a letter signed by all the NGOs about uh, heavy fuel oil in, in, in the Arctic. You know, if you want to focus on a single issue, that's, that's fine, but I said this earlier. I don't care whether it's heavy fuel, diesel, uh, medium crude, whatever it is, any oil spill is bad. So working on prevention activities, uh, and people admit that the polar code was not, is not the panacea, is not everything we want it to be, but it's still progress. And that's, that's the way you get business done. If we take entrenched positions and, and, and insist on focusing on in the weeds, we never make progress. So, you know, we'll take polar code one and start working on polar code two, and in terms of, uh, uh, let's see, ocean planning, ocean planning should be a big, every country should be, should be doing that. Uh, how, how you force that, uh, I'm not the expert on the ocean planning uh, process. Uh, I, I'm familiar with it, but it's, it's something that each country ought to be taking up. In, in terms of this, uh, this thought process of strategic planning, where do you want to be? Uh, if you want to accept the fact that it's going to be a major marine transportation route, then you've got to plan around it and plan for those things that you're going to need to facilitate it or the policies that you want to come up with that prevent it. And I'm not suggesting one or the other. I'm just saying that there's a broad range of things that you need to be thinking about uh, as these things develop and to be prepared for it. The, uh, one of the other things that I'm sure my staff and others are tired of hearing about is uh, I use a, a Fairfax County analogy in, in, in terms of, yeah, I know, I see wrinkling again. I'm sorry. I, uh, I moved out to Fairfax County for the first time 25 years ago, bought, bought a house in farmland, and uh, it was supposed to be a 500-unit uh, uh, development. Today it's an 1,800-unit development because uh, entrepreneurs were able to get the, the Wharton prison shut down, uh, and, and build more homes, and uh, continually over those 25 years, the roads, the infrastructure never caught up, uh, the schools, we just now, 25 years, years later, have a high school. It, it's entrepreneurs always move faster. The, the, the business of business, the business of prosperity and making money always allows people to move quicker than governments, which are bureaucratic by nature, uh, are able to respond. The analogy in Fairfax County, I think, applies to the Arctic. 
if, if there's an if if there's an opportunity to make money, whether it's through drilling or shorter shipping or whatever else, companies have that incentive to make profit, and they're going to start doing it. Governments, be it by their nature, are bureaucratic and slower to respond, whether it's building infrastructure or setting policy. Uh, but uh, that red light is on, and we need to be about the business of doing that sooner rather than later. Well, we're out of time, unfortunately, but I did have one question I wanted to ask Admiral Pat, and it's a very unfair question. Um, what is, from your deep and knowledge of the Arctic and what the world has the capacity to do or not do there currently, what is, is there one black swan event that keeps you awake at night that could completely overnight transform our belief that we have a long time to deal with these issues? And if so, what would that event be that we not might not be prepared for currently? I, I, I'm not sure there is that event out there, unless it was a major, you know, I, I talked about the Exxon Valdez. That was, that was something that got our attention in this country. Uh, the two things in Alaska uh, that, that were driven. You know, the first was Exxon Valdez, which, uh, I mean, how often do you see an act of Congress move? You know, that, that happened in, I can't remember the month now, October of 89? Where's Drew here? I think it was. Okay, and, and, and we had we had legislation within the next year. Uh, the only thing that I think was faster was uh, after 9-11 getting the, uh, the Homeland Security Act. I mean, that, there are major events which move policy. Do you really want that major event to happen that moves policy that fast? I, I, I think not. And as we've seen, the Arctic has been incremental. Uh, the only thing, and this is purely as a sailor, I mean, I had the opportunity, I've seen some of the change. I, I saw what the ice was like 40 years ago when I first served up there, and I've gone back and, and studied, and what I saw back in those days was not an anomaly, it was, it was the normal then. And I've seen the absence of ice 40 years later, and that's not an anomaly either, that's, that's the real thing. So that's a 40 years of incremental change, and uh, the problem now is it's speeding up. Uh, we are in what the scientists call a positive feedback loop right now. Uh, as, the, uh, as the Arctic ice recedes and there's more darker blue water up there, which attracts greater heating, the temperature increase gets faster and faster, and that's why you're seeing the ice receding uh, quicker. Uh, we need to be about the business of dealing with that, and at the same time dealing with the practical world uh, challenges that we face, whether it's shipping or other things. And oh, by the way, and I want to put this plug in, I think hopefully I've touched on it a little bit. We, we have Alaska natives that have lived there for 10,000 years. Uh, actually, we have indigenous peoples that have lived in the entire Arctic. But, you know, if you go back to Exxon Valdez, and the reason we had Exxon Valdez is because of the pipeline, which was driven by an oil embargo uh, th that uh, we wanted to get to U.S. oil, uh, U.S. energy independence. You're exactly right, Ambassador. Uh, you go up to Barrow, Alaska, and, and while we're paying $2 a gallon, they're paying $8 a gallon. And if you go in the store, uh, it seems to me the last time I went in there, a gallon of milk was about the same price, or maybe more. Uh, we have people who have lived in a region that has the oil that has helped us become independent and keep our economy running, and they pay more for it after it's sent back up there uh, than we do down here. The, the, the Alaskans deserve to benefit from economic prosperity and progress as well, and uh, that's a part of our considerations. I'd like you all to join me in thanking Admiral Pam for a very exciting presentation.